G'day guys, in this video I'm going to be deriving the impulse and momentum formula for a system of particles. So let's say that we have three particles just here, like this. Right, it's going to be a fairly simple system I'm dealing with, with only three particles, but rest assured it can be generalized to n particles, right? And let's say with these three particles that we have some generic forces acting on them. Let's say that there is a force, F1, acting on particle 1, let's say there's an external force F2 acting on particle 2, and let's say there's an external force F3 acting on particle 3, like this. Now, do these show all the possible forces that could be acting on our system? No, I mean, for all we know, there could be internal forces as well acting between our particles, right? Let's say that these particles are, say, connected by a spring, or maybe they're experiencing gravitational attraction, or anything like that. There could be internal forces here. So external forces aren't the only things at play here. We could have, for example, a force acting from particle 2 on particle 1. And I'll write that as F12 to show it's on particle 1 from particle 2. right? And let's say, in the generalized case, that we've also got an internal force. Let's write this as F13. This is the force on particle 1 from particle 3. right? And let's say also, for the sake of generality, we've also got an internal force here, I'll call this F23, it's the internal force on particle 2 from particle 3, right? Now we know from Newton's third law that um, every force is an equal and opposite force, so this is going to be F32, it's the force on particle 3 from particle 2, notice same magnitude opposite direction. This right here is going to be F31 like this, and this right here is going to be F21 like this, okay? So, so far in our system, only consisting of three particles, we've got every force acting on our system like this, okay? Now we can't do much yet. What we need to do is we need to analyze the mathematics of each individual particle and see what we get. So let's analyze particle one. Well, we know that the sum of all forces acting on our particle is equal to ma. So that means that F1 plus F12 plus F13 is going to be equal to M1 times by A1, right? Now, we could, we could stop there, but I, I, I want to show you something really cool. We can actually expand out the right-hand side a little bit more. We can write this as M1 times by DV1 DT, right? And we can go one step further. If it's true that the mass of our particle remains constant despite having all these forces acting on it, then we can write this as, we can, we can suck the m inside this operator, and we can write this as d dt of m1 v1, right? So basically, if, if m1 remains constant, then we can write the right-hand side just like this. And, and let's keep track of our assumptions. We're assuming we're assuming that m1, and I'm going to assume m2 and m3 as well, remain constant. Only so that we can perform this little trick to go from here to here, okay? Now we can't really progress any further yet. Let's write out a similar equation for particle 2. Well, we know that the sum of forces acting on our particle is equal to ma, so that means that F2 plus F21 plus F23 is going to be equal to M2A2. And we can do exactly what we did above, and we can now write this as DDT of M2V2, like this. Now, we can't do anything with this yet. Let's write out the um, equation for particle 3 and see what we get. Well... We know that the sum of forces is equal to ma, so that means that F3 plus F31 plus F32 is equal to M3A3. And just like before, we can also write this as DDT of M3V3, like this. Now it really looks like I've taken you down the rabbit hole here. I mean, we have three equations, and it looks like we can't do anything to any of them. But rest assured, using a little bit of clever maths, what we can do is we can simplify this whole thing out a whole lot. What we're going to do is we're going to treat these as simultaneous equations, and we're going to sum them all up. So let me write that down for you right now. And there we have it. This is what happens when we sum all of these equations above into one giant expression like this. 
right? And now what we can do is we can notice some really awesome cancellation. We know from Newton's third law here that F12 is going to be equal to negative F21. This is from equal and opposite forces. Let me write this down. This is going to be F12 must be equal and opposite, so that means it's going to be equal to minus F21. So that means when we add F1 and F2, sorry, when we add F12 to F21, they're going to be equal to zero. So we can write this down as saying this is going to cancel out with this perfectly to give the zero vector. Likewise, for the exact same reasons, this is going to cancel out with this, and this internal force will cancel out with this internal force. That's the beauty of summing all forces. All the internal forces eat each other up, right? And so what we're going to be left on the left-hand side is we're going to be left with something quite amazing. It's just the sum of all external forces, F1 plus F2 plus F3. Now on the right-hand side, we get something quite interesting as well. We notice we can um, suck out the whole derivative operator, and we can write this as d dt of the sum of all momentums of all particles. So we can write this as d dt of m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus m3 v3. Now let me scroll down to make some space. Now what's beautiful about this expression above is that on the left hand side, what we have here is we've got our net external force acting on our entire system, right? So remember, F1 and F2 and F3 were just external forces, right? So that means when, when we boiled down, went through the whole maths, all we got here was our net external force. So that's on our left hand side. And on the right hand side, what we get is we get our time derivative of our total momentum of our system, which I'm going to write as g total, right? Notice that mass times velocity is momentum, right? And, and sometimes it's written as a lowercase p, sometimes it's written as a capital G. I'm just going to write it as a capital G. Um, so this right here is our total momentum. Momentum 1 plus momentum 2 plus momentum 3, etc., etc. Rest assured, as you can tell, this would be generalized to the total momentum for n particles if we had n particles. Okay, now the reason I've written it like this is because what we can do now is we can integrate with respect to time and we can complete our final step of this problem and we can write that the integral of our net external force acting on our system dt, right, from um, limits from t1 to t2, right, our, 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 we're, we've got our integral in terms of time here, so we're integrating from t1 to t2, must be equal to must be equal to the integral of dg, so that'll just be g total 2, so this is our total momentum at time 2, right, minus the total momentum at time 1, right? So this is our final formula. This is everything we've worked towards, okay? We've got, when we've shown that if you were to integrate our total net external force, so if you were to sum f1, f2, f3, all up, and then integrate that force with respect to time, you will get the total change in momentum of our system, right? And that actually says quite a bit about macroscopic objects, right? Obviously, this tells you nothing about the individual particles. You still don't know the motion of particle one, and you don't know the individual motion of particle two, but you've got some information about the motion of the system as a whole, okay? So this is a really useful result. I hope that made sense, guys. Cheers.